And I ask them one question. What have you changed? And they say nothing. Uh, and I, I, I repeat it to them. I say, I want you to think about what you said. You want different results, but you're doing the same thing. Is that going to happen? No. It will never happen until you make the change. And I think this is what Jesus was talking about in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. That our minds must be renewed. In other words, our minds must be changed. What have we been taught? We have been taught some things that weren't right. And since we have received Jesus Christ, our minds have to be renewed. We have to let go of some of those things that are holding us back. So we're talking about this process. And the process of change is very difficult. But it's needed. Let me... um, so this one, you'll like this next one. <laughs> I hope you get the next one. <laughs> the next thing is God has a pastor. Your pastor did not leave. I want you to know that. You're looking at me strange. Let me help you out here. The, the, the chief shepherd is who? Jesus Christ. That's the pastor. That these guys are under shepherds, under the pastor. I want you to take a look at this verse, and I think it will be clear. This is why I make that statement. First Peter chapter five, verse four. First Peter chapter five, verse four. It says, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. We're talking about the chief shepherd. Now, here's another scripture I think that's that's really good too. Is Colossians chapter one eighteen. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. It says, And he is the head of the body, the church. Who is he talking about here? Jesus Christ, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that all things he might have the preeminence. Your pastor did not leave. Isn't that good to know that whenever he has set the head of the church, he set himself as the head and it never changes. So in that fine comfort that we still have a pastor. Because whenever God's word is preached, we can receive something from God's word. So no matter what man takes to pulpit, What we need to do is focus on the chief shepherd and keep our focus on him. Now, the next thing is that God has a promise. He has a promise. And we we love these. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5. God has a promise. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5. God has a promise. He says this. He says, let your conversation be without covetedness. Now that conversation there is talking about your manner of living, your life. And it says, and be content, and boy, that's the key right there, um, with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Wow. So we can find comfort among change because we know He will never leave us. What a promise He gives us. If we simply get into God's Word. You know, I posted this thing on Facebook that said this. You know, people always complaining about a silent God is just like complaining about not receiving text messages with your phone turned off. (laughs) 
Think about it. We want to hear from God, but we never open the book. We want a message from God, but we're so busy checking our email, our Facebook. God wants to hear a message from... He wants you to hear a message from Him. And He has tons of it if you simply get into His Word. Now, here's another scripture, another promise that God has given, given us. There's tons of them. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. No matter what comes at the church, God has promised that nothing will prevail against His church. Now, I'm pretty sure you know the scripture that says, um, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Well, no. It says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Anybody ever heard that scripture? Well, I want you to know that those weapons will form. So don't get scared when you see these weapons forming. But know one thing, they won't prosper. Because he has promised that they won't pro- they won't prosper. Isn't that good com- comfort to know? That's why we need to know God's word. So when we see all these evil things coming up against us as a part of the, God's church, that includes the, us, and nothing that is formed against us will prosper. What a great promise in the midst of change. Now, as I told you earlier, there are a couple, you have two options to handle change. Now, there's five enemies of change, and we want to make sure that we crush this and crush it early. Here's the first enemy of change tradition. It says, the glory that was. Doing things man's way instead of God's way. Change will never happen if you continually hold on to men's tradition. Is that right? I remember, and and I, I felt this way at work. You know, we had a new process going in. You know, like, oh man, well we used to do it this way. But my boss said, well, guess what? We're not doing it that way anymore. <laughs> now, I could sit there and complain, but the process is going to happen. So remember, you cannot go by what was, but you have to go with what is now. Because remember, as change is taking place, it has already been approved by God, and that change is going to happen. It's just like those season rolling. You can complain about you want to stay in summer, but fall is here. You can't tell that today, though, could you? (laughs) But it will change. So don't get stuck on what was. See what God has in store for you. The next thing is fear. Fear is the next enemy of change. We always say, um, we have not passed this way before. It's new to us. It takes guts to get out of a rut. Somebody like that one. <laughs> it take, it does. Because we always fear the unknown. But if we just told you that God does not change, He's always there, there's no purpose to fear. There's no purpose to fear. Because He is already there and He's already approved it. Now I tell you, here's the next one. Laziness. We don't want to take on the new work. That's true. You say, oh Lord, we got to do all this again. <laughs> we got to build over. And it is tough. But remember, if 
Jesus has brought, God has brought change, it's needed. So we got to now pitch in and get over laziness. It's going to require everyone to pitch in and do some work. And the next one is stubbornness. We are creatures of habit. And we don't like things to change. Well, I've been doing it this way for a long time. Oh, that's going to mess me up. You ain't thinking about what is it going to do to bring more people to Christ. You just worry about what it's going to do to you. You care nothing about anybody else but you. And you refuse to change. We have to get over stubbornness. And that goes to the next point, pride. Pride is... I am, it's it's me and nobody else thinking that we have arrived and you know all the answer. And we don't need this change. That's like telling God, hey, we don't need winter, we don't need fall, we don't need spring, and we don't need summer. We have to get over the I, the pride. Now, sometimes people will change when they see the light. But other times, they only change when they feel the heat. Think about it. Think about it. A lot of people are in their situations today and God has not changed or moved them. They say, hey, why God hasn't changed me? Well, remember, whenever you're in that heat, in that furnace, God will not change your situation because He is changing you. Don't you think about that? That's deep. Because we want Him to remove so many things from our lives, but some things are actually there to keep us humble. Some things are actually there to keep us closer to Him. But when we always complain and want Him to remove it, instead of embracing what He has put on us, it makes the difference. Now, I made this statement many times, and nobody, I don't know if anybody's listened. Remember, prayer does not change God. God doesn't change. But it changes your perspective. Think about that. That's so powerful, and I hope you get that. God doesn't change. He knows the end before the beginning. And what we need to do is see it in His eyes and act accordingly. The power of of God is real. Now I had this thing, I don't know if I really want to read it. Um, Let's take a look here. Yeah. About, there's ten things I got a lot of number of stuff, don't I? (laughs) Five things, five things. Now this one, ten. You know what, I think I'm going to actually hold this one. Let's see here. Um, it's 10 things. It's really good. Actually, I'll print it out if you guys want a copy of it. It's basically 10 stages that we go through with change. And I tell you, when I went through this list, I was in all of them. <laughs> so, matter of fact, that's what I'll do. I'll get you a printout on that so you can study. I had this um, little funny thing I ran across and wanted to show you. It was this man um, in the back mountains of Tennessee. He found himself one day in a large city. At the first time, standing outside of an elevator. And he watched this old haggard woman hobble on the elevators and the doors close. A few minutes later, the doors opened and a young, attractive woman marched out. The old man hollered to his youngest son, Go get your mother! (laughs) But you know, I've read that. That was so funny. Why didn't he get on the elevator first? You know, I was thinking about that. You know, he, he was trying to go get the wife and make her younger. That was funny. But that just shows change will come and change has to come. Now, since change has come, we told you there's two things that you can do with change. You can resist and suffer the consequences. 
If you just look at nature, even look. Anybody ever see those little squirrels? I, I was walking the other day and I seen a squirrel with nuts in his mouth. It was the funniest thing. That, so he was preparing for what? Winter. But he, he, he has so many nuts in his mouth. Yeah, I wish I could have took a picture. It was great. So you can suffer the consequences if you don't adapt.